Good. Welcome to the Academy of Medicine meeting. Dr. James Schnabel will be talking tonight about COVID and its pathogenic factors and how they work. Yay. Thank, you. thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Jim. And uh, we are going to uh, talk about something that I've been following since this thing started because I sense it was going to be big and it's uh, probably the biggest thing since World War II it's in terms of permeating through every uh, facet of society. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some things that I will, will not cover. I'm going to cover uh, issues of uh, the genetic uh, the structure of this. These are macromolecules. Uh, they're complex, large molecules. They're derived from common uh, ancestors and uh, component parts, four nucleotides, 20 amino acids. Uh, we've used a lot of uh, uh, issues uh, to uh, deal with this. I'm not going to discuss the four M's, not medicine, therapeutics, not mitigation, not mass, not mandates. So those are subjects that are outside the purview of this talk. Uh, those are rather blunt instruments, and this has all occurred on a biological uh, basis, as you can see. Uh, it's incumbent to discuss uh, criti uh, credentials. It seems to be a credentials uh, battle going on anytime somebody appears on TV or not. Uh, so I'll provide some of my own. Um, as uh, you all know, I was a staff pathologist for 30 years at Texas Baptist Medical Center. Uh, just retired. It's a planned retirement. Uh, I was a chairman of that department for the last uh, 16 of those years. Uh, prior to that, I was a, a fellow in chemical pathology and toxicology at Virginia Commonwealth uh, University, which used to be Medical College of Virginia. Uh, prior to that, I was a, a, a combined anatomic pathologist at Alton Oxford Medical Foundation in New Orleans. Prior to that, a medical degree from Louisiana State University, uh, the New Orleans uh, campus, and then prior to that, a PhD in biochemistry from Louisiana State University, the Baton Rouge campus and uh, my mind was in physical chemistry. Uh, this was something I did when I was 25 years of age, uh, before I even considered medical school. Uh, I did a primary structural analysis and confirmational analysis of transfer RNAs, which at the time was the uh, hot uh, uh, medical topic, uh, or the top, top, uh, a hot research topic in the circles. Uh, I, uh, uh, it was five years I spent in that program, and uh, so I am conversant with the subject and uh, uh, was always thought in terms of structure function relationships that function follows form. So these molecules have various shapes and conformations, and the function is uh, determined by the structure of those molecules, whether the molecule is engaged in replication or if it is. Uh, Engage in immune post response to the uh, uh, to the organism or antigen under consideration. Uh, it's important that you think conceptually of viruses as uh, in the root terms a chemical in the box uh, because um, uh, that's what they are. They replicate. They've been around for millennia. Uh, they uh, they mutate. That's what they do. And mutation is not an issue of survival value. Uh, the New York Times uh, two Sundays ago made reference to a Wiley virus as their lead uh, headline. Uh, these are not Wiley viruses. They do not conduct, uh, they do not have uh, uh, human qualities of will to live, rationalization, or intelligence. They're basically just uh, chemical replication uh, factories. Uh, I have to show this gentleman. This is Dr. Schnabel von Rom. Rom is a little village in southern Germany, uh, where my ancestors came from. And Dr. Schnabel uh, is down head to toe. There's no skill of exposed skin on him. He's wearing a beak. Uh, beak translated into German is Schnabel. So I'm Dr. Beak. Uh, it contained uh, uh, lavender and peppermint and uh, spices and herbs that were meant to one arrest the smell of death during. Uh, during the Black Death, this is a copper plate from 1656. Uh, he is ground from head to toe, and he's also got a wand in the 
pond is used basically for three reasons. It's a good abundant waters. Uh, it's used to kind of move people around, as you can see in the lower left corner there. And it also is used to conduct physical uh, examinations at a distance. Coronavirus uh, is something we were, are all familiar with. It's roughly 30,000 uh, bases and single strand RNA. There are four or five structural proteins. These are proteins that end up being in the virion. And about 16 non structural proteins. These are proteins that are the, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, proteases and uh, constructive uh, uh, proteins that are used to help build the virus. Uh, there are another uh, five to eight proteins that could go either way. Uh, they are non-structural proteins, but they also can end up in the uh, virion, but they're not essential to that function. So uh, there are four genera, which, uh, which uh, are the part of our standard cold viruses that we think about. Um, SARS-CoV-1 outbreak was in 2002. It was from bats with a civet vector. Uh, also involved in ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 receptor is a vasodilation receptor. It's most common in the heart, in the intestines, in the testis, um, uh, as opposed to the ACE receptor, uh, antitensive converting enzyme, which is vasoconstriction, and the entity to which we have our antihypertensives, uh, some of them directed. In 2012, there was a MERS outbreak, and that was also originating bats with the near zoonotic vector of the camel, species of camel. Uh, both of these had fairly high um, uh, case fatality rates, but they did not progress. So they each killed about uh, 1,000 people. Uh, generally speaking, the symptoms of the uh, MERS and SARS, uh, SARS-1 and uh, MERS, were, two, uh, were prodrome period about two to four days post-infection with a one to three week course. SARS, uh, a severe acute respiratory syndrome with the severe with, uh, respiratory sequelae with an age uh, uh, disease progression. This is from Goldman and uh, and uh, Cecil from uh, two, uh, from uh, from uh, 2017. This is the 26th edition, and you can see uh, uh, very easily that uh, they re made reference to. Uh, coronavirus infections in elderly patients or chronic care facilities. So we knew uh, at an early point that we were dealing with uh, a disease that has a, a known, uh, a known uh, uh, pathogenesis that targeted elderly people. This is based on the previous, uh, uh, previous lesions. There was forewarning. So everything changed at the beginning of uh, two years ago. Uh, the, uh, the original stories came out. Uh, there were some people that were sounding the alarm. We, it, it's important to note that there were many models of, uh, of uh, potential uh, mass pandemic viral outbreaks, and, and a lot of the legwork had been done uh, going into this process. Uh, but as with everything, you never prepare until it actually happens, and then you have to kind of reinvent the wheel. Very early on in March 12, 2020, there was an article referencing the, uh, the problems with testing, which are still going on as of this talk. Uh, there were also there was no real guidance. The FDA had uh, uh, authority over the uh, testing thing. Uh, one of the reasons why we did not use the World Health Organization testing is because it was specific to coronavirus as a species, uh, so it was not really. Uh, uh, ferreting out the SARS-CoV-2 entity that was causing this problem, and there was a lockstep of the FDA and the CDC together, so a lot of, uh, there was, a, as you recall, a, a delay perhaps extending to two months uh, regarding uh, this test. Also, a lot of states, or five states to my knowledge, have been doing double testing or double counting. A person would be positive for the antigen once it was available. They'd be positive for PCR, they counted as two patients. So there was a lot of uh, confusion uh, related uh, to this uh, particular issue, and uh, not, uh, not a particularly good situation. Proximal origin, there was a paper from April of 2020 that uh, came out uh, on this, and uh, we had a, uh, we had a situation where uh, proximal origin 
uh, was this postulated, and this is uh, from that paper. Uh, this is the base sequence from of, of SARS of COVID 2 from 1 to almost 30,000. It's a note that the spike protein is here, and this is uh, where it's located. It's roughly 4,000 bases, or by extension, about 1,200 since each uh, base, the three bases, code for one amino acid. Uh, we have uh, along here what are called OR, ORF domains. There's one here and one here, and then there are other ones here. ORF means optical reading frame. And uh, this is a, uh, these are areas that are trans, uh, translated directly to messenger RNA. This is a positive sense RNA strand, which means as soon as it's in the host, you can translate protein directly from it. You don't need a complementary base uh, structure to do it. This works immediately upon entry. If you blow up this spike protein, you've got roughly 1,285 bases or about uh, well, well, actually, these are these are amino acids. It's 1,285 amino acids in length, which is uh, close to 4,000, about 3,700 uh, uh, bases, nucleic acid bases here. There's an S1 unit that comprises spike protein, and an S2 subunit. In the middle is a cleavage point between them. So this is a polybasic cleavage site that occurs right at this uh, point here. And it, uh, I want to point out that at the 680, there's a PRRA sequence here. Make a mental note of that because these, this was a study that was done. They looked at SARS-CoV-2 all along here with the with comparing the bat penguin, SARS-CoV-1, two SARS-CoV-related species. You see a lot of sequence homology where the colors are the same. The boxes pertain to isolated entities were the same. What's intriguing to me and what I noted when this paper came out is that there's no sequence homology at all here. There's nothing that matches that four base PRRA sequence. The letter is a single letter nomenclature for amino acid. So P is proline, R is arginine, A is alanine. Uh, this is the receptor binding domain over here and this is SARS-CoV-2 and related Structure. So the receptor binding domain and the polybasic cleavage site and the furic cleavage site are two things we're going to be discussing a bit later on. So uh, this is a paper that came out in um, August. So the first paper I showed was in April. This one is in August. And uh, that has the same sort of thing. The dark blue and the pale pink are sequence homologies. Again, you look at the top line of source cov 2 you've got the bat COVID behind that. Penguin below that, uh, RA bat, which is related to SARS, but not the same. Four penguins, actually five penguins behind that. So you see a lot of sequence homology, and there's the five days of cleavage site. P, R, R, A, there's nothing in the sequence site except for this uh, uh, rat RA right here, which has three of the four. A little bit of basic uh, science uh, for you, uh, for your uh, edification and remembrance. Letters don't bind. You learn letters in med school. Letters don't bind. Structures bind. So always think in terms of structures. Don't think in terms of letters and that stuff. So G, uh, complementary RNA is C, C to G, A to U, T to A, it's a DNA. And that, what happens is that guanine uh, has three base pair of three hydrogen bonds, a cytosine. Adenine has three, uh, or two actually, thymine, or in RNA, it's adenine and uracil. So thymine and DNA, in RNA, there's no uh, uracil in DNA. So the reason is evolutionary. Thymine is a little bit more resistant to, uh, uh, to degradation. So, and then you've got guanine uh, to uracil, that's a, a, a two spot. So when you produce the, uh, the segment of DNA and you produce the segment of RNA, there's a ribose, a moiety that's a background, it's a polymer of ribose with a phosphate in between. You've got the bases, this is A, G, C, and T uh, in DNA, and uh, uh, A, G, C, and U, uracil, and RNA. RNA is more apt to degradation because this, this number two carbon here is a, is a hydroxyl, here it's a proton, there's no hydroxyl, so you can oxidize this and break it apart. So these are more labile, RNAs are more labile. Additionally, DNA, because of the structure, 
to double bump, uh, has a double uh, helix, as you're aware of. So the bases are in the middle, protected, and the sugars are on the outside, and they're protected because the, uh, the, the DNA cells can't do that. So evolutionarily speaking, RNA comes first and probably had DNA as an archive library venue, which is in its own structure, as you know, in the nuclear membrane. So when you look at RNA replication, again, replication is RNA to RNA or DNA, uh, or rather RNA to RNA to RNA to DNA, which is reverse replication. Uh, reverse, uh, no, DNA to DNA is replication, RNA to RNA is replication. Uh, so RNA replication, again, you have a positive sense of RNA, which is what this is. You generate a, a complement from it, and then you develop, and then that uh, complement synthesis goes over here. So you've got this negative sense, and you, you keep making more and more. You keep cycling this, and get more and more copies. So this is how RNA replication occurs, and uh, it's done with a fair amount of fidelity. Not as much as DNA, but RNA, you know, does it. But the mutations can occur if you make errors in this in this in this process. Uh, going back again further, you've got messenger RNA. It's again, it's a, it's a uh, positive sense RNA. So the five prime on that end is a three a phosphate on that end, and the hydroxyl on the other end. And the three base uh, sequence uh, occurs there. And you've got a start terminus, a, a start code on, which is um, defining a definition. Uh, it is located here in this uh, chart. This is a genetic code. We get the first letter second letter, third letter, and then each one codes for various or, uh, 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 various amino acids. So what happens is you have a messenger RNA, you've got protein RNA complex called ribosomes, and the transfer RNA comes in, and then this growing chain of proteins attaches to the new incoming RNA, and you get a protein chain that's growing out and then folds on itself, it's modified in some cases. Uh, just as a point of lineage, the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize in 1968 was awarded to three investigators. One of them was Harcourt at Kiwana, University of Wisconsin. One of his postdocs was my major professor. So I was immersed in this stuff uh, for five uh, years. This is complicated because this slide is complicated because I wanted to indicate that this is a complicated process. You have protein that complexes, RNA comes in at this point. This is an energy intensive process, energy is expended in two areas. This complex then uh, attaches the messenger RNA and the, pro the messenger of the transfer RNA is here. The methionine and its process keeps repeating itself for, uh, uh, until you get the methionine and you get this long strand of uh, protein that occurs. You can generate about a thousand copies uh, per minute. This is a remarkably efficient, very rapid process. So you, you, when this stuff gets going, there's a lot of proximity. You recall that you know, the energy of two, or, uh, two objects it takes a lot of energy to put the two objects together. The enzyme does that. It attaches the one, orients the other one, and the activation energy drops. That's what makes, that's what makes these reactions go. They're catalysts uh, by definition. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has this life cycle. If you want to uh, uh, call a virus having a life, it really isn't. So we don't, as I said earlier, you don't want to uh, do what the New York Times did, refer to a wily virus, or a virus that outsmarts you, or a virus that needs to be conquered, or any of those other you know, nonsense that occurs. SARS-CoV-2 has, uh, has spike proteins on the surface. There's an attachment to ACE2 receptor. Uh, the, uh, the membrane to grow in proximity. The, uh, the, the virion is introduced in endosomes. You can actually see this on electron microscopy. It opens up, the messenger RNA is free. This is five cents, so you get RNA replication occurring, and you get multiple copies of that RNA plus proteins that are also synthesized off of the uh, messenger RNA template. So you get a series of proteins that are structural, nuclear capsid, envelope, spike, membrane, RNA, it gets reassembled in the Golgi apparatus, you get a complete virion, and then exocytosis back out. This is not, this, you can control this step. That's what we're all trying to do, is control this. 
once it gets here, you can't control it. The therapeutics are geared towards this end right here, preferably. But uh, the, the, the process is uncontrollable in terms of mutation. So anytime message RNA gets introduced in here, it's, a, it's basically a mutation. You've got 30,000 bases there. Mutation theoretically could occur anywhere, but it usually occurs in favored locations. It's rare mutational propensity in certain parts along this genome. So it goes in there, you've got messenger RNA produced the replication, you've got proteins produced, they become part of the final product, and this is uh, you know, sent on its way. Someone asked about it, am I going to talk about it? Yes, I am. Uh, this is a paper, you know, this, again, these things can occur in waves. This paper came out in November, there was a bit of a uh, pushback uh, when uh, Delta was going rather uh, rampantly through the uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through this uh, uh, pandemic, and there was a um, uh, a paper put out by uh, Michael Warby, uh, who was an epidemiologist, uh, who did uh, what's usually seen in toxicology circles, where you do uh, cancer uh, uh, toxicology tracing. So he got apparently he had some of the earliest victims and was able to ascertain about 35 percent of them uh, had uh, 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 some connection with the Wuhan market. This is uh, Wuhan. Wuhan, if you take uh, China, which is about the size of the United States, and superimpose on the United States, Wuhan is located roughly where uh, Knoxville is. Not in Spurgeon or Knoxville, but that's roughly where it is. It's an industrial area. So the Wuhan market is located right there, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is right here, about 15 or so miles away from that. He was able to determine about 35% of the earliest uh, victims of COVID had ties to the Wuhan market, that 65 did not. Uh, he also speculated that the civet cat or the raccoon dog, which is a species of fox, were likely vectors, without any sequence data evidence for that. It was a strict speculation. But given the time, this was a, this had some visibility and sort of a bit of pushback uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the press uh, going back to the idea that this was a zoonotic vector. This was an early paper by Fauci, Lane, and Redfield from uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, March 2020. Uh, which uh, dealt uh, with uh, the, some of the earliest uh, findings that we knew at the time. One was that it was basically an elderly uh, disease with pre-existing conditions and there were no cases in children younger than 15. So the big question was you know, how many people are being infected, how many kids are infected, is it subclinical, do we know? So there was a lot of speculation in the paper. We will be going back to this paper a little bit later on. Uh, the, uh, it's important to note uh, how this uh, came into being. So this is, uh, this is uh, I just plugged it in, Wuhan to anywhere, and uh, then did some you know, fancy thing. And so there's a lot of travel within China, you know, Wuhan to other locations, but you can see the little tentacles going over to other places. These are first quarter uh, January through March bookings of uh, flights out of Wuhan to these locations in 19 in 2019. So this is the last normal year. Uh, 13,000 in the United States, 9,000 Ho Chi Minh City, 17 to Seoul, 18,000 to uh, Tokyo, 50,000 to Bangkok, 30,000 in Japan. People see this, uh, you know. Uh, or the potential was there. Uh, I got this page, uh, paper from the uh, India Times. I want something that was early. I want something from a non-involved uh, uh, non, uh, entity, which India was at the time, because the calendar is important. A lot of calendars that are coming out of this country and elsewhere are massaged a little bit. This came out early, and it's important to know how this went. The first notification of uh, SARS-CoV-2 was an ophthalmologist, 34 years of age, two social media posts. Uh, he later on developed COVID, ostensibly from a patient with glaucoma, and he died in the hospital. He's a famous person. Six other doctors died at that hospital. Uh, on the 
31st, there was notification from the Chinese authorities, the World Health Organization, that something was amiss. The wet market was shut down the following day. Uh, the wet market was disinfected, destroyed, all animal samples destroyed at that moment. Uh, the time frame up early is in question, and I can show examples of that later. On January 7, the coronavirus infectious agent was confirmed. First fatality reported January 11, first international death in Thailand, January 15. Human to human tr transmission on the 20th. You recall that was not a thing until then. Wuhan was shut down 23rd, Italy closed flights on the 31st, USA on the 2nd. On the 3rd, the World Health Organization met with Chinese officials and they deemed that the, the shutdowns of the airports and international flight bans were unduly uh, harsh and needless, uh, uh, needlessly harsh and unduly uh, invoked. That was on February 3rd. On March 11, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. And on March 27, almost three months afterwards, the Chinese halted their national flights. Um, so questions about how far did the virus go could have been stopped. You contrast this with Omicron, which was noted on a Friday, and the world was shut down from South Africa on a Monday, the latest. Some countries did it immediately, it was still out there. So they estimated this from New York Times, April 16, 2021, 430,000 people traveled from China to the United States since the coronavirus surfaced. So there was already seeded very nicely, 430,000 people. That may or may not include 300,000 uh, Chinese foreign nationals in universities and colleges. Some of those stayed uh, over the time, but my guess is that they all went. Uh, this is the, when they write the history of uh, SARS-CoV-2, this will be the most important event. This is a paper that, that was put out by the Imperial College of London, March 16, 2020, by Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson's epidemiologist is an extremely complicated, mathematically intense paper. And what Neil Ferguson, what Dr. Ferguson did was to say in an unmitigated epidemic, 550,000, 510,000 deaths in Great Britain and 2.2 million unmitigated uh, circumstances would die in the first year. Uh, this was an important paper because it did two major things. One, it changed uh, public mitigation policy in both of these countries. Number two, it overturned decades of uh, research on the effects of mitigation in a population under uh, pandemic circumstances. This is the most important thing that occurred with the SARS CoV apart from the origin, which I'll be elaborating on shortly. The SARS CoV 2, as you all know it, again, the messenger RNA with N protein, these are nucleosomes, these are basic, uh, basic meaning they're, negative, uh, they're positively charged, polyaminos, lysine, arginine, that help to fold it. If you stretched out DNA, it would reach from me to you in a cell about you know, five to 40 yards. RNA, uh, depending on what you're looking at, can also stretch out, so it has to pull. And there's a lipoprotein coat and then spike proteins that you are aware of. This is another view of it here. You can see the proteins, uh, nucleocapsid in the middle, as I said, spike protein, uh, membrane, envelope, M protein, E protein. And uh, this is the spike protein blown up this area which is shown here as a receptor binding domain. This is the part that contacts an ACE2 receptor. The vaccines code for this part and a little bit on either side. So this is, this is actually from uh, 2018. Well, I'll just turn it on. Uh, this is uh, from 2018. RNA vaccines, uh, new era of vaccinology. RNA started as a uh, messenger RNA started as a uh, as a uh, as a research field in the late 80s, and really took uh, took root starting around the beginning of the uh, uh, century, around 2002 or so. The biggest problem with uh, our messenger RNA was that it couldn't last very long. But the idea of using short segments of messenger RNA to use in diagnostics and therapeutics, so it was attractive and there was a push that really took root around 20 years ago to make it happen. The 
critical thing about this document, what I do, I show the title uh, thing with the authors and then the pertinent area that I'm going to show you. Um, moreover, for most emerging virus vaccines, the main obstacle is not the effectiveness of conventional approaches, but the need for more rapid development and large scale deployment. So, what sells the messenger RNA vaccines is uh, that. You remember this from med school, uh, and this is the ideal. This is what we're trying to shoot for over time. We have the first antigen exposure and the second antigen exposure, preferably the same. The first antigen exposure gives a small boost in uh, immunoglobulins, so uh, for, uh, relatively speaking, mainly IgM, some element of IgG. You get some memory cells produced from that, and then after you get the lag phase, you shoot a second antigen, and then you get this large boost of IgG, a less uh, prominent boost of IgM, and then lots of memory cells, which is constitutes adaptive immunity. Uh, the big struggle, of course, is figuring out what this gap is. So it doesn't harm you to wait longer. As you know, the Moderna interval is three weeks, and the, uh, the Moderna element interval is four weeks, and uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech was three weeks, and uh, Johnson Johnson, the Janssen vaccine done with the concert with Oxford was a, a one shot. So a lot of people think that that initial two shot series caught you on this part and you never got to this area. So some people think that the two shot was really just a one shot that was slightly separated. And that the booster is doing this. You know? But uh, that ideally you want to have this uh, pattern right here with the same antigen. If you mix antigen, you have a different antigen here and here, you've actually got this process repeating, in my opinion. So this is a paper that came out very early, uh, uh, the table I ran into very early or midway through 2021, or 2020 I should say. Talking about the different technologies and the license platform and the speed. So you see all these manufacturers that are, that are involved. Sinovac uses an inactivated virus. Uh, Janssen or Johnson Johnson uses a vector, non replicating. That's the Oxford and AstraZeneca right there. Uh, you've got the, uh, the RNA viruses, BioNTech, Pfizer, uh, Moderna out here. Uh, and then, the, but there are two things that, to draw from this. The first thing is that is it a licensed platform? And as of this printing, the RNA mRNA was not a licensed platform. This was novel, novel technology. The other thing about that message RNA was that the ones that were fast, this was fast. So it had the things I referenced earlier. It had a light, it had no licensed platform, but it was fast. You could go. Current scale could be raised a bit to so get a lot of product here. So these were basically first out of the gate because these are more time consuming elements. And some of these are very traditional, non replicating vector, obviously DNA and inactive. So a lot of these companies just dropped out or they couldn't come up with the product. <coughs> this is another view of, uh, of this. And the, the top uh, row is important because. Preclinical is very brief. It's not human testing. This is an order of two-digit people, three-digit people, four-digit people. Okay, so you've got uh, tens of uh, people here, hundreds of people here, thousands of people. So you're testing safety and immune response, efficacy, safety and efficacy, and then finally you have the field studies where you're monitoring the real world. So when you look at an efficacy, you've got a controlled situation. You test efficacy here. You get out here, efficacy really doesn't matter because you got out there. So in epidemiological circles, you're actually testing for efficiency. And those are broad strokes because there's a lot of individual variability. So you can see that the, the, some of these, you know, you see that the, the, uh, the various platforms that we use, protein, viral vector, and you can see the message RNA had already gotten to phase two. So here's the Moderna right there. Uh, buying tech uh, also got out to here, so they were they were pretty quick out of the game. So with that, with other entities like proteins lagging behind. So this was from Time magazine. So you've got disabled virus, which is Sinovac. That's a Chinese uh, thing, full genome and a protein, a lipoprotein coat. 
You've got viral vector AstraZeneca, uh, uh, was used. These are the ones that, that are, it's actually a DNA transcript that's put in and connected to adenovirus, which is a known, uh, adenovirus is a known commensurate uh, uh, vector and used as standard in standard applications of vaccine development. And then you've got the RNA, which is uh, Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech. It's important to note that BioNTech is a manufacturer. Pfizer is the parent organization. Uh, uh, Moderna started initially around 2002 in a joint development uh, situation, not as a company, but as a sort of loose confederation with the Grove Institute at MIT. They were formed uh, in, 19, in 2010, Moderna. This is their first and to date their own product. BioNTech, uh, was uh, began in 2008 and 2018, they were purchased by Pfizer. So Pfizer supplying the money muscle, they did not need any help. The Moderna uh, it was involved with NIH, so Moderna and NIH are joined at the hip in terms of vaccine development. Uh, let me go to, uh, yeah, no, right. so this is a, a correlation, this is a useful uh, talk, because we talk about you know, PCR is being a confirmatory test. A PCR will will uh, assess and uh, confirm any virus amount that you have. What you do to make uh, the uh, PCR work optimally uh, is to run is what we call cycle threshold. Cycle threshold is illustrated here. So you have a, a genome here, it's a, it's a double strand DNA just for reference and say you separate it and then you do more, you do a replication of it. This is it's done on, with automation. You have then four copies and they anneal to each other, you divide them and then you make copies of those. So every one of these is one amplification. So the cycle threshold is the number of times you do this amplification. When you do that, this is a this is data out of Paris. Uh, this is what happens. So the cycle threshold goes from uh, 11 all the way up to 37. This was a very elegant. I, I kind of like this uh, this experiment a lot because the uh, you've got two curves. This is these. This is a cell culture positivity at one week. This is cell positive cell culture positivity three weeks. So it's just three weeks of generating a single signal here. One week here, this tells you that there's very little virus here. So the question is, how many, how much virus do you need in order to affect a clinical condition? Where do you draw the cutoff? And uh, for the French investigators, they thought the cutoff should be uh, drawn about 25 to 28 cycles, right here. That way, you catch most of the real virus that's causing trouble, but you're eliminating people who are subclinical or have a good immune response. And uh, those people are not uh, really a danger to society. Uh, what's the number that the NBA uses to get the healthiest people on the planet? 35. So 35 you know, catches everybody, even the NBA players, none of whom have died nor have been hospitalized. Use that as an example then. If you want a certain outcome, the PCR can make your job easier or harder depending on what kind of outcome you want. In actual fact, the PCR is a confirmatory uh, test that's used. The antigen test, which we'll be discussing later on, is uh, a screening test by definition. Uh, to get off the uh, science topic, historians uh, need to weigh in on this. So, the Washington Post, most year ever. Uh, 2020 was certainly a contender, uh, but if you go back, if you use deaths as a sole criterion, then 1348, when 200 million people died in, uh, in uh, Europe, would be in Canada. And if you looked at the United States, they picked 1862 as a clear winner. If you go by deaths during the year, that would be, that would, these would be your winners. Obviously, you could look at that and say, well, where do trends and you know, world situations lead, but you don't know that in retrospect. That's only a future development. So, 1917 doesn't make the cut. 1968 doesn't make the cut. 2001 doesn't make the cut. Um, but um, these are what they've picked. 
So there's a dichotomy occurring uh, regarding uh, the origin. But back in February, Lancet put out an internet uh, uh, communication signed by 27 uh, medical professionals saying it was zoonotic transmission, end of sentence. One of the sig uh, signatories was Peter Daszak, who heads Eco Health Alliance. Countering that early on was a lab leak hypothesis. So the question there was which of these is occurring? Let me say really quickly these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive because uh, you could have an animal zoonotic vector run in your laboratory. It's easy, it's time honored. You could take virus from one animal, you put cell culture medium with another animal lineage and pick out the viable clones from that sample. So they're not mutually exclusive, but the effect of this paper was to squash any discussion of lab week for a series of months until, frankly, uh, Delta occurred. So in January of this year, World Health Organization spent two weeks in China. The first week they were in quarantine. The second week they were given uh, tours of uh, the facility, they were given uh, summary documents, at no point did they see uh, raw data. Their consensus uh, by both of them was zoonotic transmission. They had no reason to believe otherwise that was the information they were given. It was not a smooth, uh, uh, it was not a smooth uh, uh, meeting by any stretch of World Health Organization has talked about doing this again. So this came out two days ago, so I obviously grabbed it. So there, uh, there was a, uh, make sure that was all. Uh, okay, no, let me do this one, that's what I remember. Uh, so this is one example of possible um, lab leak uh, spread. Uh, if you go, everything, let me point out regarding in Wuhan Institute of Virology, Everything that occurs in that is monitored by this country and Australia and France and the UK. Everything comes out of there. Satellites, the whole bit, every piece of internet data that's out there, everything is looked at. So if you look at some of the stuff that vanished, you have to get it from Google Cloud and find sequences that did not exist. The best way, the only way to find out what started is to get the early sequences. You gotta get the sequence of the earliest victims and index patient, which Dr. Warby thinks was a middle-aged female and not a male that had glaucoma. It was actually there for ophthalmology uh, ophthalmic reasons. But this is a paper that indicated that this was probably a lab leak. Uh, Counting that as the animal and zoonotic method, if you go in that direction, this came out two days ago, where 1,700 animals that uh, were on the, uh, the listing of uh, animals sold in markets. I will point out that the wet markets in China are a major industry. They're not unlike the cattle market. You can't shut it down. They actually shut it down temporarily as a result of SARS uh, CoV-1. But the lobby for the wet markets is so powerful that they went back into business. And I'm sure the same will occur here. You can't shut down something that has high societal demand even if you try to educate them to the contrary. So this came out, there were 1,700 animals, 61 species looked like at, and no viruses closely related to either SARS-CoV or SARS-CoV-2 detected any of the 1,700 animals examined. That did not stop the interpretation saying that, well, the index animal was probably lost to follow up, may have died, may have been purchased and eaten, who knows. But uh, there, is a, there is that. that uh, this, the, the author did posit two mechanisms by which you could arrive at SARS-CoV-2, but they were theoretical only. And the problem, of course, is that a lot of this stuff may be lost in follow-up, which goes into gain of function. Uh, you know that that's, um, you know, this political theater discussing gain of function is a uh, is a uh, is a thing out there. Uh, so there are do there are groups that meet. This is not an official government agency, but they discuss the, med the legal and the medical implications, the ethical implications of gain of function research. This is a seven page document from uh, HHS uh, regarding uh, 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 
discussion of enhanced potential pandemic pathogens as opposed to potential pandemic pathogens. Uh, there's no discussion, no definition of gain of function anywhere in this document. So asking a government official is something gain of function is not to give you an answer because it's not reportedly defined in this document. So what happens is the NIH funds about $34 billion of research around the world. So doing SARS-CoV-2 and NIAID background research is that this is being a website. So it's done. Uh, the question is, uh, was it done temporarily correlated to uh, the problems we have today? I could not find, this is from Moderna, this is from Pfizer, I apologize for the lack of, uh, of uh, focus here. Uh, I couldn't find a structural uh, discussion of the Moderna vaccine. This is a schematic of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. I think they're pretty similar. You have the, uh, the receptor binding domain that contacts the, uh, the ACE2 receptor, and there's an adjacent to that part of the S2, and right middle here is a junction between them. So this, about, this is a message of RNA that, uh, that has the, uh, the, vice of the, the protein cleavage site between the two, receptor binding domain. At this end, at the tail end, is a, is a long screen adenines, which does two things. One, it signals cessation of uh, translation, the protein being uh, produced from this. It also is a protective thing. If you've got RNAs and it's on the to digest RNA, it will act on this and leave the business end alone. There's also a five prime sequence here. So the thing, putting these two at the end signals to the host that this is to be this is to be translated protein. And that's why these are there. So this is a, a description of the of the, uh, the Pfizer thing and there are two mutations that were put in here. Uh, the number is the number of the codon, the three base sequence, it's a characteristic of this, and over there, they're gonna be about 1,200 uh, uh, codons corresponding to proteins, this is 986, 987. These are single acids, so the, uh, the amino acid valine, so uh, it's replaced 987 by proline. So this is the, this is the Pfizer schematic form. So the original reports that came out March were uh, spectacular. 94, I'm surprised it wasn't 100. And it, it's a circular type of experiment. You have, uh, this was uh, a two month uh, window, at minimum maybe two and a half at the outset. So what they did, they, um, they produced the messenger RNA vaccine, they put it in the non age adjusted, which is a broad age, not age adjusted, no increase on the. Uh, the the elderly group, for example, it's an even a uh, uh, population from 18 on up, and uh, you put in messenger RNA that's geared to the wild type, the original virus, and then you wait and see how many of them develop a uh, viral infection. So they gave this the people who were not vaccinated, people in the control group, eventually got the, you know, the Pfizer uh, uh, BioNTech vaccine anyway. So this is a two-month window when phase trial was done, 94 percent is uh, effective. So this is a milestone. Again, I mentioned the, the timetable. December 1, according to this, was a, a COVID-19 illness document, unpublicized on November 17. So the, you got to get the, the initial date right. In November, the Wall Street Journal and other places reported three people with COVID-like lung symptoms. But, you know, we don't know. And again, nothing was determined. January 2nd, uh, January 10th, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was sequenced. And on January 15th, the mRNA vaccine based on this sequence, this sequence was supplied by Chinese authorities. The vaccine was predicated on that sequence. The phase trials began March 16th, May 2nd, from Moderna and Pfizer. And uh, phase three uh, started both of them at the end of July. So you can see that, that this was a two month uh, you know, window. Uh, 74,000 and about 42,000 from um, Pfizer and uh, 30,000 so from Moderna. 
So the interim efficiency of the, the, the vaccine efficiencies were announced in great fanfare. Uh, the, uh, the emergency use authorization vaccine is still EUA uh, category. Uh, and then the first uh, vaccine was given to a critical uh, care nurse in New York City on December 1. This is an astonishing timetable. If you relate this to the way the timetable is for vaccines, which is a problem. Not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's very fast. So I promise I'll be coming back to this paper. It's a paper that's been taken out of context numerous times. From the same paper, uh, Fauci, Lane, and Redfield, uh, that whatever one look, uh, hones in on is the middle part. The clinical consequences of COVID 19 may ultimately be more akin to those of severe seasonal influenza. So because you take something out of context, you're implying that this was going to be like influenza. No. This, uh, this was predicated on determining what the infection rate was. We didn't know the prevalence of the disease. All we could do was determine the cases as they appeared. But we didn't know how many people were asymptomatic. We didn't know how many people uh, were uh, symptomatic and not you know, following up with uh, medical care. So we didn't know what the number was going to be. And if it was going to be like influenza, then you could make that statement. This has been taken out of context the more times than I can care to remember. The World Health Organization has much to say about this chart. This is a uh, this is from Wall Street, this is from Bloomberg Business Week. Year zero to year plus five, five and beyond. Talking about the discrepancy. This is an important slide because the, the virus first appeared in relatively well-developed nations. So they were the ones that were first out of the block with the vaccine, and the vaccine is going to go to them first. So they anticipated, and again, this is from March of uh, this year when there was a great push to get everybody vaccinated, everybody got in line. So they were thinking by uh, midway through the uh, first year uh, after introduction, uh, which would be in the middle of this year. Everybody in the United States would pretty much be fully vaccinated, UK a little bit earlier. Uh, what happens is you get a discrepancy. You roll, you get with a limited good, i.e. the vaccine, you've got areas that are relatively over-vaccinated, areas that are relatively under-vaccinated and non-vaccinated. So the mutations which originally occurred here, because that's where the virus was originally traveling, now occur in this area, and because of mobility, that structure redounds back to here. So if you develop a vaccine and it's wild type, by the time it gets out here, you've got something completely different. So there's South Africa right there. There's Kuwait, there's India, uh, there's, um, uh, I can't read that. It's probably an important place, I don't know. There's Australia. Australia is very late to getting vaccinated. So some of these timetables have uh, changed over time. But uh, the, the critical thing is that you've got this slow rollout and that causes uh, the virus to uh, replicate and mutate from that. <coughs> so you're starting to get not, not unpredictably breaks through infections when people are fully vaccinated and still contract the virus. Earliest reports in Washington State and then there was originally thought that the virus should come uh, would become an endemic. Uh, endemic means uh, uh, that it's out there, but it's not causing wild bursts of uh, hospitalizations and uh, mortality. So we talked about immunology. This is a review. I don't want to get too far off the weeds, but the vaccine is introduced. The vaccine is taken up. Uh, the messenger RNA is uh, uh, in the system. The, uh, uh, Spike protein is trans, uh, translated, the spike protein is signaled by the adrenic cell. It goes to germal receptors the, where, and, uh, and the periphery and the cortex of the lymph node. You get an activation of helper cell CD4, uh, CD8, and interleukin 2, which is uh, on cytokine storm that's on the chart. You have antibody, you've got uh, memory B cells, you have long lived plasma cells with their. Uh, uh, antibodies, you have uh, T uh, uh, follicular helper cells, so you've got an antibody response, but you also have cells uh, like natural killer cells that don't require antibodies, they simply recognize more material through the major histocompatibility complex. 
So we don't know anything about, well, we don't know what prevalence is here, and there's very little data on that point. Uh, it could anywhere be from two to 10 times. This was one study that was actually done in Science Translation of Medicine in July last year, which talked about uh, five times prevalence of rare diagnosis infection. So if you've got, say, 50 million people who uh, you know, have either been vaccinated uh, or, or have had, actually, 50 million people with, with documented disease, five times that'd be 250 million. That's a point where you start to run out of people, but to the virus, it's a host, and it's simply a chemical reaction that occurs. Which brings us to this on my chart. Again, this is wild type virus. This is the S1, this is S6, this is all spike protein, and the junction between them is the protein cleavage site. So Delta has these uh, these mutations are not present in wild type. There's a brief, brief flurry of interest in lambda. So when you look at the spike protein, you've got a uh, little, uh, this delta right here, it's the only one you need to look at. But these are uh, mutations that are not present in wild type. When you take the messenger RNA, you digest it in specific enzymes, you can get little fragments and you label, you electrophorese them, and this is what the PCR test shows you. So the mobility changes slightly from one virus species to the other. What's interesting about Omicron is that Omicron uh, has what's called a T gene, or rather S gene target failure. So the RNA is supposed to strike and give you one of these S bands. It doesn't work because it's mutated. So a lot of people uh, did not treat that as a SARS-CoV-2 species. So this was probably hanging around a lot longer. It was only later on that the scientists in South Africa or Botswana determined that that lack of S uh, in the template or the electrophoretic pattern was in fact uh, another source coping species. It was just one that was so heavily mutated that the signal was lost. So now we're sensitized to it and we can detect that. But so this is what's done as the piece of the PCR looks like. We hear a lot about viral neutralization. I will say that uh, the only in the only field study uh, regarding viral uh, vaccine efficacy was the very first batch. Since then, every uh, every study that's been done uh, in, uh, to push the envelope has been done by companies. So Pfizer and Moderna have done this. This is what viral neutralization is. You've heard about it? You've read about it? This is what it is. So you take people and you take their plasma from vaccinated uh, individuals. You do serial dilutions. It's a step two, serial dilutions in play. Uh, you add live virus or pseudovirus. For Omicron, the earliest report was pseudovirus. They didn't have Omicron present, so when they did, they took a, a segment of uh, nucleic acid, they synthesized it, and threw in some, but not all, the mutations and mimic so when they did that, you get uh, some uh, neutralization of that uh, pseudovirus of SARS-CoV-2. You add cells, you determine from the cells which of these are infected. So if you neutralize it, you would have uh, fewer cells available. If you did not neutralize lots of cells, you could put this on a graph and determine the amount of neutralization. So neutralization, you hear about the booster being able to neutralize to a an amount. I mean, if you think about it, you know, it's the same vaccine that's been done, you know, that's given to you all last spring, and the booster is the same formulation. So again, you go back to that double graph that I showed earlier. If it's the same one, where are you on this new thing? And how much, uh, you know, how much uh, immunity when you actually gone? So people have a question about this. So this is a letter to the editor from the Wall Street Journal July 21, book by Theodore Glickman, 1990, Readings and Risk. And uh, this is kind of verbose, but I'll summarize it for you. Vaccine hesitancy in this uh, formulation works very nicely. It not only describes the domestic situation, it also describes the opinion of vaccines that occurred coincident with the election last November. It also discusses, it also accounts for vaccine hesitancy overseas which is presumably 
unaffected by the uh, domestic political timetable. So what happens is, is that people are without agency, they have no say-so in the matter. So they are basically charged with a situation where they've got this pandemic, there is a good, which I call risk object, that's being offered to them. They have no say-so over it. Failure to do it means you lose goods, sir, goods, you lose services, you lose jobs, you lose travel, you lose a whole bunch of things. So penalties, short of overt coercion, are fairly drastic. So these are people who are without any kind of agency or decision making. So they see the risk object and they look at it and they find a problem with it. So the earliest problem with the vaccine was AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca never gained a foothold in the United States, not only because it had clotting problems, glycopathy problems, predominantly in females, but it also, uh, they, they were problems uh, with AstraZeneca filling out the documents correctly. There's a study that was erroneously filled out in Brazil. There's a big treatment in Bloomberg Business Week on that. It's sort of a window into the, the decision making process that occurs uh, in the FDA regarding vaccines and approval. So the thing about Moderna and Pfizer is that they knew how to play that game. AstraZeneca did not. That's why they're not in this country. AstraZeneca is now focused on third world or underdeveloped nation dispensing of their, of their product. So anyway, you've got a problem, you see a problem, and then you look at it, you basically have no control. So you look at the product and you say, okay, there's a problem here. What else is wrong with it? So you've got two things that are going on. One is if you're without agency, this is my opinion. One, if you're without agency, you find people speak to you and for you. So you view these people with authority. So there's one um, uh, logical fallacy, which is uh, appeal to authority at one end, and at the other end, you've got potential uh, confirmation bias. You've got two fallacies that are going on simultaneously. And you can build a case for either side, because the third phase of this is tribalism. You become pro this, the anti that. So if you have tribalism taking hold, you might have a home in your own tribe, but to the opposing tribe, not just wrong, but you're evil, you're probably dangerous as well. So this is how you get from what was initially a fairly unified view of the viruses about a year ago to where we are today. And I think it works very nicely uh, as an explanation and it covers a lot of bases. So Delta appears around the summer and uh, the intriguing thing about it was that the amount of uh, viral replication was uh, indistinguishable between uh, uh, you know, vaccinated and unvaccinated. What, what caught my eye was these were isolated single nucleotide uh, mutations. Uh, these are single nucleotide mutations. When you look at, at the origin of SARS-CoV-2, if it's an animal, you want to have broader areas of commonality, you don't want single nucleotide. Single nucleotides apparently is a biological way in which this thing mutates. It's not mutations involving longer segments of RNA from other species. They're basically just point mutations where one nucleic acid changes and amino acid changes. So, this was a paper that came out uh, in July talking about various spike mutations, D614G again. The, D is the original amino acid, 614 is the codon, G is the next amino acid that replaces it. And uh, you've got uh, various uh, you know, mutations that occur that made this uh, more um, virulent. Virulence is, a, is, the, is the, what we see, and it could occur at any point in the life cycle of this uh, virus. Infectivity or transmission is how it gets into you, and replication is how it copies. These are three different processes governed by three different things. It's probably easier to show it. Uh, so this P618. What's intriguing about this one is that 681 is where the proline that I mentioned earlier, so that was trans, uh, that was mutated to another arginine. So you've got arginine, 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 alanine, and this is the furin cleavage site right here. Furin is a host origin. This is a human, in our case, a human uh, protease that breaks the, the S1, S2 uh, parts of the uh, coronavirus spike protein and 
as a reason for that. So when you look at this uh, that mutation, which facilitates the spike protein, you've got uh, D614, which opens the spike protein structure and then the easier for the virus to latch on. You've got T478K, uh, which uh, binds the uh, protein into the activity, and now we over here. Uh, but vaccines can either uh, be helpful to you, they can be completely Superfluous, but it didn't harm you. Harming is what's antibody dependent enhancement. This, this is uh, something that's probably not occurring. Uh, they tend to be more family oriented. So, um, uh, dengue virus, uh, respiratory, uh, essential virus, measles are known vector or known mechanisms for uh, antibody dependent enhancement. There are two mechanisms. Basically, if ADE is what happens when a virus comes in there and comes out uh, with more copies or more virulence, so what's more copies is ADE. And so what happens is that the virus occurs and uh, it, it's effectively walled off in the monophage. What happens is it's an antibody instead of facilitating the structure that actually protects the vulnerable parts. It protects the vulnerable instead of enhancing the structure. So it basically builds up the nucleus and the endosomes and uh, replicates rather freely in the, in the antibody instead of causing it to be destroyed, actually protects it, blocks it, and protects the thumb part. The other mechanism seen in these is our speed where the complexes and this is walled off and sealed while the rest of the uh, while the rest of the uh, damage occurs. Uh, it's important to note that the SARS CoV 1 works as an endothelial damage thing. One stuff is secondary to endothelial uh, process uh, where a lot of the spike protein acts. So, this is the ideal. Uh, the ideal, um, if you were going to do the ideal, what you want to do is have uh, a rollout, a massive rollout of vaccine. Everybody take the vaccine and uh, uh, mitigate for a couple of weeks. This allegedly is occurring in China. Uh, I don't know. China lost two people last year to COVID. It's not a nation of almost 1.4 billion people. So it's either working or it's not true. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is the idea. So you want to get the vaccine rolled out and everybody uh, mitigate for a couple weeks. Uh, and the reason for that, and the best way I can determine that, is that you want more mutation aspect. But no product is going to be done that way, you're going to take care of your own place, right? So this is, so what happens is uh, in, in epidemiologic circles, you go with uh, what's called Swiss cheese model. The Swiss cheese model is every slice of Swiss cheese uh, is a different mitigation. So holes that develop in one form of mitigation are arrested by other uh, mitigation processes. You apply all of them simultaneously and rigorously. So you do the math, so the social distancing, you stay out of the water so you don't get too close to people. And you, uh, you uh, have social distancing and you wash everything down, even though contact transmission is about 2% total. But everybody washes stuff because we bought into the idea that it would be virus on surfaces, but that doesn't tell you anything about the viability of the virus. It just tells you there's a fragment there. It does nothing about the thing. So, this is the ideal situation, and the vaccines are part of that process as well. So, but on the, on the good side, that you get, you do get, even with the first vaccination, you do get a very good uh, uh, memory cell, and the, the memory cells, a lot of this work is being done out of the Hoya Institute of uh, Technology uh, by, uh, by the people there. So you, get, you do get a memory B cell, memory T cell. The problem is that as you get older, you have few, fewer of those cells. You don't have as many of them to do what needs to be done. Whereas a younger person not only has more of it, they've got a thymus gland that's pumping out lots of lymphocytes. They've got relatively larger and more cellular compositions in their lymph nodes. And they have more stem cells that can be, uh, can be uh, transformed into any of the cells that are needed. Plus, there's some ingrained immunity that they inherit against other coronavirus species. So, people who are younger are better off in that regard. 
So when you do the numbers, if you go by you know by uh, decades without normalizing for uh, for uh, the number of people, yeah, the, the, the linear progression. The only linear progression you can see SARS CoV two is age. Older you are, the worse off you are. The more comorbidities you have, the worse off you are. They are, they work in tandem with each other. So you see the number uh, goes up from 385 to 17. 182,000 uh, uh, below the age of 85. Uh, you won't be able to read this, but the percent normalized to the number of people in that age cohort goes progressively from 0. Uh, 0. Uh, 0. 0.18 uh, at one year of age to 2,800 above the age of 85. So that's the only linear uh, progression you're going to see. Around September this year, uh, the administration and task force had attempted to answer the question of uh, what caused it. Uh, it caused four elements at the National Intelligence Conference assessment, low confidence that it was a natural exposure to zoonotic uh, infection. Four elements with low confidence. One element with moderate confidence that it was a laboratory associated incident. And three uh, elements said we don't know. We have uh, at uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, uh, bioweapons lab. There are people who do this profession. Trust me, they know. They know what's happening here. This was done, this was a, a brief uh, uh, document that was uh, meant for like, the Hoyt Malloy. Uh, they know. They know. It doesn't take much you know, to you know. And the people who are on the television also know that they have authority. If they don't have authority, it was uh, ER doctor in Brooklyn that's uh, complaining about this caseload. He doesn't know. But the people who do know, know. That's my opinion. Uh, this was uh, from Israel. I use this because uh, 674,000, not uh, 260, which was the uh, CDC sanctioned research out of a, out of a facility in Kentucky over two months. Seven, uh, 674,000 is more than 260. So if you looked at this uh, card, uh, SARS uh, naive people who were fully vaccinated, people who were partially vaccinated, people who had acquired infection, and uh, you would still, even if you were vaccinated fully or had partially, you still had increases of uh, 13, 6, 6, 7 fold of, uh, of disease over the population that had a, uh, um, an infection with SARS-CoV-2 and then looking for breakthrough infections with the infection. So uh, that, that, that's a robust study and it looks at the whole spectrum of disease and uh, it's very thorough. It's unfortunate that we are reliant on, on Israel data. It's a small country and they, uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, data out there. Our data was out of Kentucky, 260 people, over two months. Uh, in relation to that, this is actually the second time this happened. You know, before uh, May 16, 2018, vaccine immunity was uh, more verbose. Uh, it was immunity using the uh, BMT cell lineage. That was the definition of vaccination, according to CDC. Uh, that changed uh, in uh, May of 2018 to say produce immunity to specific disease. And then in September last year, it was to produce protection to specific disease, which is a more uh, imprecise term. So you know, the language is important. You hear slogans and words and things like that. The words convey meaning and purpose. And protection is not a phrase you would find in any sort of uh, referee journal article. If I said, I would expect to have it rejected. So adaptive immunity, you have innate immunity, which are the barriers, the barriers we all possess, and then adaptive immunity, and you have the B cell and the T cell line with the effect of T cells. So some of these rely on the antigen only, others rely on the antibodies. So you've got the memory B cells, you've got plasma cells here, T helper, natural killer cells, uh, cytotoxic T cells, and that in. This is the second, this is the phase that you're trying to boost, you're trying to boost that. Think about the neutralization assays. If you look at it, just have kind of one narrow window. So you know, the neutralization, you look at this window, and you've got all these windows that are also available. 
So the, the point of the batter is the vaccine may not uh, give you anything more than getting a T cell memory spot. But the batter is good enough. It's not necessarily great, but it's probably good enough. Um, in my profession, we want to make sure this is done correctly. Uh, at one point, the FDA had licensed about seven uh, tests uh, for uh, uh, rapid antigen tests, which is here, and uh, do it at home. But most of these initially, the way they were licensed was for antigen point of care. These were screening tests that were licensed as medical devices, meaning it's supposed to be done in a medical facility, administered by a medical practitioner and interpreted by a medical practitioner with a reflex to PCR if the patient was still suspect or um, had a uh, positive test. Uh, the CDC has uh, this uh, report, uh, Binex now is the, more, the most uh, prevalent test that's being used and uh, the uh, critical issue is that the, uh, they looked at the test, uh, again this is a this is a fairly limited number of people, 274, 124 uh, people, and uh, if you look at um, the sensitivity and specificity, you get divergent numbers. When you have a screen test, you have a choice. You can either have high specificity or high sensitivity, not both. The specificity is statistically the ability to pick out a true negative from a whole population of negatives. So if I had a specificity of 95%, that means out of 100 negatives, I've got 95 that I'll label correctly as true negatives, a negative test, and five of those are, um, are false positives. Those five get positive, but they're actually negative, false positive. All of these antigen tests have very high specificity. So false positives are not a problem, even in the asymptomatic not positive. If they're truly negative, false positives are not the issue. The problem with these antigen tests is on sensitivity. So if it's sensitivity is true positives with a whole bunch of positives, it's true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So when you get sensitivity of 64% from symptomatic and 36% from asymptomatic, what you're saying that uh, these are these are patients that get the result and they can piece it off. I don't know what the cycle threshold is. I'm sure it's quite high because you're trying to do that. But if you wanted to reduce them, if you wanted to increase your sensitivity, you would match the two. These, these companies err on the side of specificity because the consequences of positive tests are more severe. Positive tests can your career, it keeps you off the plane, it keeps you off the boat, it keeps you out of, uh, out of any sort of mass gathering, sporting events, restaurants, who knows. Skies and limit. Note that there are very few people in this CDC report, 147, 274. This is their, their document. This is from uh, November of 2020. A, uh, for, if you go with, with PCR, PCR you get 64 to 35. If you go with the less um, uh, uh, analytically precise uh, 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 cell culture, viral culture, which I showed earlier. Then you've got an increase of sensitivity to 93 percent of symptomatic and 79 percent of asymptomatic. But nobody does viral culture, it takes too long. They go to PCR and then it drops down to these numbers. Uh, and this is uh, so this test was done as a one off as a medical client. You do it in a medical doctor's office. If you're still symptomatic, even with a negative, you go get the PCR test. If it's positive, you go to PCR. Um, but uh, if you are, but it was not designed as a serial viral load test. It's not designed to spread out to like confetti over the population and have people run at home. Because this is this is a test that you put the, the swab all the way back of your nasal pharynx and you back of your throat. These tests, as they're designed for the home, is a little swab through the narrows. Very there's very little virus here as opposed to back there. In fact, Go to Twitter, there's a push to have this test done to the throat, go back in front of the yield tire and back in front. And they found that out on their own. Instructions have it go circle the nose. So I'm just saying that the, the, the 
of all the things that occur with this, this works on me the most because I would be this if I gave you a bad test that's being used badly in my estimation. And that's no end in sight as I have a billion of these and have to do this. So what? You're positive, you're positive, stay home. You've got negative, you're positive, stay home. So, uh, Scott Godley has a book. Scott Godley is the head of the FDA. And, uh, the book that he's got is the best seller of doesn't take its own institutional task. His, his quarrels with the CDC. The CDC works on the auspices of the FDA, so he ran it. But that aside, the CDC uh, uh, had a test that they were developing. It was a three step test. The reagent is contaminated with coronavirus, and there's another problem. So, in three steps, the first step and the third step were problematic. That information was buried under our. Uh, uh, Robert Redfield's uh, auspices, and that's why we had a delay. I don't think it mattered because I showed you the data of the you know, 400,000 people married in the United States from China over the first quarter of the year. So I don't think it really mattered, but testing was and still remains an issue because testing, you have to think psychological testing gives you empowerment because if you look at the Risk objects. Every risk object associated with SARS-CoV-2 is favored by one tribe or the other. There's a tribe that favors masks and mandates and vaccines, and the other tribe favors ivermectin and non clonal antibodies and uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine and just going out and getting infected like you did with these chicken pox back in the day. So, how good are the vaccines? This, I like this study out of nature because it, it basically throws out all the really complicating, uh, all the really complicating uh, uh, entities. It's basically deaths here, vaccine rate there. You can see these are countries and counties in the U.S. Uh, in the world, and the numbers are all over the place. There's Israel up there. So, they've got high mortality, they've got high vaccines, you know, they're somewhere in there. It's all over the map. Because again, as I said, vaccines are designed against wild time. And this was from August 2021, before Delta was even confirmed. So I, I looked at that, this was August. I, I we got data from the end of October, this uh, literally the sitting in the chair. So I wrote this one. And this is uh, this is vaccine percentage in the adult population fully vaccinated. And these are deaths per about 100,000, I guess. So this is the United States. Each of these dots represents a state. So what the so the, what are the ones with the circles around them? Those are the red states in 2020. It stops very neatly at 66%. All the red states are there, the blue states are here, it's a, it's a renegade state here. But uh, did it matter? This is a line. This is from the end of October. States with High vaccine, low mortality, high vaccine, high mortality. There's no in between. So again, this is this is this stuff. This is molecular biochemistry. You know, so the durability is quite good. This is the, I think this is the Pfizer vaccine. So if you're gonna get anybody response is waning, you could still get a good uh, result. Um, uh, but in this end, in this uh, situation, they thought it waned enough that they needed a third, third booster, which is in September. So they pushed the boosters, and only today the, uh, the CDC rubber stamp giving boosters to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the 12 to uh, 18 year cohort. Uh, this was a Wall Street Journal letter, and I liked it because it, this is a guy of Charles, uh, Professor Stanley Alexander from uh, Southern Cal Med School. The, said what I was thinking, again, PRRA, um, proline arginine originality, not seen in any organism, not seen in any living thing. So the question is, how did it get there? Was it man-made, retro-engineered, low affinity for horse to shoot that? So, so this is a guy who professionally does this. He's not, he's not sitting at home listening to podcasts, you know, retired, and, you know, getting, you know, losing weight, and, you know, just trying to, you know, Kill time until I get an adjunct. If anybody needs an adjunct, I'm open to that. 
Uh, but anyway, he said, you know, where did this come from? Where did it come from? And that's important because this is what happens to a source code too. When you get that uh, S1, S2 cleavage and PRRA site, it changes from this shape to that shape. What happens is S1 uh, is cleaved and dissociates the S2 protein, which is bound to the uh, to the viral membrane. Uh, it attaches uh, firmly to the host membrane. This this, uh, this protein then brings the two membranes in uh, uh, position, and the uh, the E and the M proteins on the uh, membrane uh, literally destroy. Uh, Transport mechanisms and cause fusion with the host and the viral envelopes, and the messenger RNA is released into the cytosol of the host cell. So, this is how this will occur. Why is proline special? Proline is special because there's nothing else that looks like that. That ring at the core has a proline ring. So, it's a five member ring, four carbons, and nitrogen. And what's different about that from the other amino acids is that all these amino acids have this part in common. Three amino group, carboxyl group, proton, carbon. All of them have that structure. The, the R bit, the, the side chain to its difference. So it's valine, leucine, isoleucine, but on the thionine, the sulfur, tyrosine, aromatic, melalonine, aromatic, tryptophan, lysine up here. So proline doesn't have a proton. Proline is this, so you can see that it's different. So when you put that into a structure, protein structure you call is alpha helix or beta sheet, and that's based on the composition of amino acids. Alpha helix is a, is a deep, even spiral. Beta sheet kind of looks like this. These are interactions of protein. They form a structure, a tertiary structure. This is not Germain, um, coordinates, like hemoglobin, and stuff like that. But you, the, you get free rotation, peptide bond between that main group and carboxyl. But with proline, it freezes it. You can't get any rotation. You can you get, you can get uh, angle change plane to the screen, you get outside the screen. The rotational angle, which is a mega, is frozen. So what happens? You get a kink. A kink. You literally get a kink by like inserting inch joints. Instead of one continuous bone, but inch joint, it causes a kink. So if you want bang to the bottom, you put proline in. You want a little bit less bang, but still some bang, you put in charge amino acids, so you negatively charge amino acids. Glutamic acid, aspartame, positively charge amino acids, arginine and lysine. So proline, arginine, arginine, alanine. Somewhere, it came from somewhere, and it's what came precisely at the cleavage point between. S1, S2. What that does is it makes it easier to uh, facilitate the uh, subsequent cycle of the uh, virus. There's a paper describing that. So this uh, segment uh, right here, 687, what well, that to the start at 681, stops at 687 codons. There's an insertion right here. They added mar uh, arginine to this, and it's a canonical pure like um, I want to go back to this. There are two proteins in here, HR1, HR2, that after this uh, this uh, this cleavage occurs, they covalently bond and length of this. So there is some study on this. Uh, on this, and this is actually an interferon, and that was from early last year. So this is what it looks like. This is the, uh, the spike protein here, and there's uh, S, uh, S1 and S2 right here. So the pure cleavage sites here. When that occurs, this is what binds to the ACE2 receptor. When this cleaves, this stuff dissociates, and this part binds directly to the cell membrane. And then it changes its conformation and allows the entry of the virus. So what happens when you have the pure cleavage site, the, uh, the receptor binding um, domain, RBD, uh, which contacts the uh, ACE2 receptor, really flips up. So you get the cleavage, the protein cleavage site, which is over here, and this flips up. The RBD contacts the ACE2 receptor. So as long as it's down, once it's cleaved, it flips up and contacts it, and then you get uh, an interaction between the two.
How does it go? I, I, I want to ask some questions of you. Yes. Yeah. So this is, a, again, the structure here with the membrane here on cleavage side over here. RBD down, RBD up once you get the cleavage side at this point. That's the viral membrane, and uh, this is how you get shaped. Uh, they said match booster doses were approved or recommended in October, and I, I want to pull this out because I want to make sure people understand this. Allowing mixed boosters is likely to smooth the messaging and logistics of the booster rollout by allowing pharmacists and doctors and flexibility to administer available shots and patients. So in my opinion, if you get Pfizer in your double uh, vaccine dose last spring, that booster should be Pfizer, ditto for Moderna. If you mix and match, you introduce a brand new antigen and you're basically just recapitulating primary response. I think this is bad science. That's just my opinion based on the material I presented earlier. But because it makes it easier, you don't have to memorize whether I, did I get Pfizer, did I get Moderna. You just go into the pharmacist and say, here's the booster, and you take it. Uh, this is an issue of uh, viral kinetics. Uh, peak load of uh, viral breakthrough infections similar unvaccinated. So vaccinated people and unvaccinated have the same uh, 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 viral load for Delta. So that's one of the reasons why uh, Delta had a uh, hard not value, double that wild type, and Omicron is about three times that. So it's about six uh, times difference between wild type and Omicron. In some formulations, Omicron has an even higher one, not quite a measles level, but so uh, So this was uh, more data. This is our VA uh, health administration uh, looking at the uh, vaccine effectiveness. And it was declining um, uh, across the board to 48%. Janssen, John, Johnson, Johnson was 13.1. Uh, the the uh, death, though, was, uh, was, was uh, also occurring uh, uh, you know, above age, below age 65. This is dropping across the board that was in November. So at that point you were talking about, well, do we just uh, go through the grief phase, you know, anger and denial, and we move to the bargaining acceptance phase. So Jefferson Jones uh, was uh, quoted by Melissa Gilly saying, well, maybe we just have to, uh, you know, maybe we're not going to reach any kind of threshold on this. And the CDC was very uh, distressed by that. Just 58.5% of members go back. Say we do need to increase the uptake. Uh, that uh, Jones is an unexpected admission. Shouldn't work, please. Uh, Dr. Brooks said, unfortunately, Jones is an unexpected admission almost makes you less motivated than for people vaccinated. So we move on. Uh, this is a uh, uh, some discussion about. Uh, D uh, 614 G. D, I think it's a sports aid. G is glycine. Uh, so they're talking about higher viral loads. They're concerned again, these are the things that are occurring uh, with, uh, with Delta. So when you look at the lineage, the, the early versions, Alpha and Beta, you know, they, you know, they, Alpha started in the UK, but you're looking at the more remote ones Colombia, from you, Peru, from land of Delta. Uh, South Africa or Botswana for, uh, for Omicron. Uh, you know, these are occurring outside the realm of the uh, you know, Again, it's a, it's a continuing cycle. And, uh, this was a, an interesting paper by Obermeyer talking about the, the time frame of emergence and the, uh, the mutational uh, component. Delta is right here, so it's getting a little bit more mutational. Omicron is off this spring. Look at the Omicron data. Omicron is off the screen about right here. So it's a much more uh, mutation thing. And you know, the, the issue of competing for you know, viral competition or viral crowding, things like that, that, that's an epidemiological construct. That's looking at broad data and say, well, at one time we had more wild type, and it's alpha, it's beta, and now we've got delta, and now Omicron is up here, delta is the rest. So what's, what's occurring in fact is that the virus, uh, as it mutates, 
so strictly a house bars issue. So you know, saying that you know, the only way to, to qualify that would be if the house was presented two strains, two different strains of bars, delta and ultra. But there's no there's no saying that there's no evidence to indicate that the house is going to sign. It's going to be infection to one or the other, both, and then we'll supplant that. And that's what we're seeing. You know, people with Delta, people who have been vaccinated, people who have had chronic disease, are being infected by the Kwan because the Kwan is a completely different uh, disease. And this is data out of, uh, this is actually some data that I think I got from, uh, these are two modeling uh, for front and back. This is a, uh, the ACE2 is separate here, front and back. And what, what happens is, is that when you, when you look at the Omicron, this is Omicron here, the native virus, the wild type, is the green line. The green line is the wild type. The blue line is Omicron. You can see so many areas where the, the line is just up by itself. We have cryo-electron microscopy. So cryo-electron microscopy freezes the structure so you can literally see the structure and you can see what the mutation does this structure. A lot of this work is done in scripts. It's done in UNC Chapel Hill. It's done in you know, other places around the world where you have a, a protein, you see the structure uh, of the cryo-electron microscopy, and you decide what would happen if I put a pearl in here, so you put arginine over there. So you can actually make that with messenger RNA left, and then and then see what the structure looks like. You can even test it biologically. We have so many more tools that exist compared to when I was doing this. So to drive the point home, here's the wild type genome. That's receptor binding domain. And the uh, break-even point of the cleavage site between S1 and S2 here. So delta is here, so you see these additional uh, mutations. And this is Omicron. This is Omicron has about 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain. This is about 250 amino acids. 15 of 250 is about uh, 7%. That's an extremely high mutation rate. It is of interest to find out how did this start because we've been doing some excavation. If it started in an HIV person who had, you know, who had been hospitalized for two or four months, they've got samples from day one of the mission. They can track the sequence data on this. But you can see the vast number of Mutations that occurred in S1. We even have a, a mutation in the 681 locus of the, of the, pro, of the pure and cleavage site. Remember PRRA, well, the piece changes to arginine and delta. Over here, the proline changes to histamine. So we have the sequence data, and to me, the two mysteries about the SARS CoV 2 one is how did this get all these mutations? Where did this come from? They looked at deer, there's no South African outbreak of deer that could do that. I don't know where it came from. The other uh, curiosity is where did the flu go last year? And uh, that's another lecture. So if you look at the Omicron spike protein, uh, every one of these dots represents a mutation, and that's the receptor binding domain right there. It is chemically perhaps almost unrecognizable. So the idea is that, in my opinion, this 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 uh, mutation I never used the word Francis Collins was interviewed on the uh, TV show to make weapons and produce some variants, which may be flawed. These are not variants; that's that's code for it. These are new mutations. So my sense is that it's vaccine, but it's an uh, antibody invasion. This is too dissimilar uh, to uh, to render things is infected. So my sense is that the booster gives you two months of antibody tiger and then by four it's gone, by six it's certainly gone. So the booster, in my opinion, basically just gives you a bridge and may not even be protected from that standpoint. I can rationalize that for the elderly cohort of people with this comorbidities by just speaking to somebody who's been immersed in this topic and has the background Thing, try to think through this stuff. Uh, I, I just don't see how that goes.